Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I, um, I will show today a presentation that I um, titled Mapping with Care. And um, I uh, hope that you can be um, uh, gentle with me because I'm presenting work that is very much in progress. And this is nothing finished. And it's very much ideas that I'm still trying to think through. And I'm also hoping that this um, presentation will be a good opportunity to have that conversation together. And um, I will show you a little bit um, about my practice and my relationship to the topic of care in general. And then I will uh, tell you a little bit more about the project that I'm working on right now as a researcher at the New Institute. Um, but these topics uh, are also something that I have been uh, addressing in my other research and teaching practice. Um, I'm uh, trained as an architect and urbanist, uh, but for many years I don't work in architecture as such. I moved to uh, practice in the cultural sector, yet still um, I'm focusing on subjects related to architecture and urbanism, um, and I do that through teaching, writing, publishing, curating, uh, uh, producing cultural events. Um, and what interests me in, um, in this way of practicing is that it's uh, often being between different institutions. Uh, so uh, I'm working sometimes on projects that I initiate myself, or sometimes I'm invited to join a project somewhere else. And that also allows me to not be tied to a particular disciplinary lens. So often in my projects, I'm making links between architecture, art, digital culture, and social and ecological urgencies. Uh, and in this um, uh, particular moment, I'm um, busy with the question of um, what can radical care be uh, or what can it mean in architecture and how architecture and other spatial disciplines can be based on anti-racist, feminist, post-colonial values that build social and ecological justice. And what I want to mention was really important uh, for me and my work is that it's always departing for a form of critique about past and or present but it's always really important that there is not, not only criticism, but there's also a form of proposition on a direction that we could take um, uh, in reshaping the existing structures um, around us and allow us to think of how we could build uh, new ones that are based on non-exploitative or extractive uh, practices. And just to give you a little bit of um, context and like which capacity I'm uh, engaging with these subjects, um, uh, this is something that I'm going to talk about a little bit more with Inter tomorrow. So I just briefly want to mention it because it actually has been the first project in which the topic of care has been explicitly formulated in my work. And um, both the zine and the syllabus emerged from the Money Lab 7 conference that took place in 2019 in Amsterdam. So just before COVID, and uh, we were about to present it in 2020. And our whole idea about what that meant actually changed because the context in which we um, we're telling these stories very much changed, but um, we're going to say more about that um, tomorrow. Um, so the zine also led both me and Inta to a working group that is uh, facilitated by uh, Arias in Amsterdam, and Arias is, a, is an organization that facilitates interdisciplinary research at um, the several um, uh, uh, humanities um, uh, focused uh, universities in, in Amsterdam. 
Um, so in the group we have uh, many different um, researchers, artists, uh, practitioners who approach the cross-section of topics of care and ecologies from very different uh, points of view. So we have people who are in medical humanities, I'm in architecture, uh, interest, culture and media, and uh, we also have um, uh, artists who are dealing with uh, visual and performing arts, and together we look at subjects such as health, in, uh, health injustice and loss and grief or feminist finance, but also um, different ideas of like how care can be practiced in these different disciplines and what relationships um, exist um, beyond, let's say, the disciplinary silos. I've been also writing uh, uh, quite a lot about uh, this topic. This is uh, just an example of a more recently published essay in a design magazine um, where I'm looking at care through the lens of the difficulties that we have to perceive our world as entangled and interdependent um, uh, in terms of relations between humans and, and non-humans and where I try to look at possibilities how this inability could be uh, overcome. And most recently I um, taught a short seminar at the Academie van Bauken, so the Academy of Architecture in Amsterdam, uh, which is reshaping its entire curriculum uh, to respond to the climate crisis and to teach designers in different ways. Um, uh, and what we did with a group of teachers, we were asked to um, to uh, construct a new course, which uh, had a slightly cryptic name and it's called Exact and Social Sciences, uh, but the course was uh, aimed at uh, creating opportunities for students to understand different disciplinary positions and to position themselves uh, as designers in between different scientific points of view and what we found particularly important in that course is to not only focus on science but also other forms of knowledge that are perhaps not seen as uh, scientific. So uh, we had several uh, groups, each focused on a different topic. My group focused on care. There was another group um, that looked at climate migration, uh, post-growth, justice and footprint. So each of the seminars was structured around one uh, quite complex, let's say, uh, topic. And the idea was that the students could see the different layers that, um, uh, that are important to understand that topic and to see where design can play a role in it. And in my group in particular, we looked at what does it um, uh, mean to care in relation to, to architecture and city making? Who do you care for or with or um, uh, um, uh, how can also the different disciplinary perspectives that talk about care uh, help unpack these different relationships? And we also um, had a little bit of time to speculate what that kind of care-oriented um, building practice could be. What was really important for me uh, with this work with the student is, students is it was to always relate theory and practice so that the theoretical ideas would not be a kind of loose inspiration hanging in the air that they then don't really know what to do with but that they could find some sort of grounding in already existing practices uh, that, uh, that do that one way or another and to see how they could translate into their projects, their ways of thinking and their ways of, um, uh, yeah, not only thinking through these subjects but actually practicing them and bringing them to, to their everyday life uh, understanding. And what I'm going to talk a little bit more extensively about, but I think it's very closely related and it's also a way for me to 
really find this bridge from theory to practice myself is a project that I uh, have been engaged for about a year now. Uh, and it's a, um, it's a project at the New Institute uh, in Rotterdam where I'm uh, a researcher. And I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the New Institute, but I think what is important to know about it is that it's a museum for architecture, design and digital culture. It used to be the National Institute for Architecture that in 2012, if I remember correctly, was fused with two other institutes that focus on design and digital culture. So then it became this kind of new entity that also um, looked at not only one discipline, but um, three. And what is important, I think, to mention about it, that it's a cultural institution, so it does not have an academic profile, but it does a lot of research. Uh, for a fact, actually, uh, in the last years, since the fusion until recently, uh, research has been quite a central focus of the Institute and it was often uh, remaining uh, in a kind of like highly abstract theoretical uh, level. And uh, since last year we also have a new director, Eric Chen, who is really challenging us to test uh, what we're thinking. So it's not really about developing only new ideas, but about trying to practice what we preach and really uh, use the institution as uh, a testing ground for, uh, for all of these ideas. And the interdisciplinary character um, is, I think, also really important to keep in mind while following the presentation. So I think what is um, driving also this project that I'm doing at the new institute are these questions, how can we do things differently? And also what role can cultural institutions play in it? And in this particular case, what role can a national institute um, can play to be more embedded locally? Because that's also something that um, um, new institute has become a part of this national infrastructure and it is nevertheless still located in Rotterdam but it has been for a very long time kind of disconnected from the city itself from its inhabitants and um, uh, the, the urgencies and the problems that they're dealing with so this project that I'm working on uh, which is called the new academy uh, also tries to uh, look at it in a different way and um, New Academy is also um, uh, not only, let's say, uh, an internal project, it's also a collaboration with Rosie Braidotti, uh, who is a professor emerita from Utrecht uh, University. Um, and she's a feminist uh, philosopher um, uh, with um, um, uh, yeah, quite a um, distinct focus on uh, post-humanism. And this is also the theoretical perspective that she is uh, bringing into um, the project, uh, where we aim to develop and implement a program that can connect knowledge, design, and policy uh, to provide alternatives for shaping the city's transition into an ecologically and socially just um, city. Uh, of course, it's not only our team, including Rosie at the New Institute, that works on it, but we're also very much aware that we have to reach out and open up to the partners in the city and work together with them shaping that project. But this is something that we're very much in the middle of. So I also um, know a lot of you have been working in this way as well. So I would. I'd be very grateful if you have insights, lessons learned, uh, learned and, and, um, and feedback on the way that we're trying to, to structure it. So this project um, is given shape by uh, four elements. Uh, one is Rosie's posthuman methodology, uh, focusing especially on the notions of posthuman knowledge and posthuman convergence. Uh, 
Uh, it's the position of the new institute that I just mentioned as an interdisciplinary institution that connects uh, the disciplines of design research and public engagement and yeah, is focused on public engagement. Um, there is a need for more testing ground uh, that the new institute wants to focus on um, in ways in which we can design social and urban transitions. Uh, and the Rotterdam as the site of the project. And I'm also, I'm going to give you a little bit more background in some aspects that um, we find quite meaningful uh, about Rotterdam. And to just uh, give you a little bit of the theoretical framework, um, uh, what uh, Rosie um, frames as this kind of uh, important aspect to um, attempt to make a transition into a sustainable and inclusive society is that we need a more adequate understanding of the multi-layered certification of post-human knowledge as being produced by all of the different actors that are involved in it. And that means that we need to pay equal attention to the uh, digital as the environmental factors and their consequences for uh, human as well as non-human subjects and uh, avoid the idea of single issues. So embracing complexity and um, to the extent that we uh, can. And um, what I think is also uh, important to mention and is very specific to Rosie's approach is that really special attention needs to be given to the status of dehumanized and marginalized uh, others. Uh, so uh, not only um, you know, the, the purely ecological uh, view, but uh, we need to keep in mind that some humans have even less rights than non-humans. So, um, the, uh, the attention um, uh, to the dispossessed who miss out on the technology but bear the consequences of the ecological crisis uh, in an equal way. Um, and I'm going to make a little bit of a brutal jump, perhaps, forgive me for that. And I want to tie this introduction and the way we're trying to think through that project to the way how urban planning and data function now. I think all of you are aware of it, but just for the sake of contextualization and also bringing the language uh, and the attitude with which uh, it's being approached to, to this room, I think it might uh, be fruitful to uh, just play this short clip. Uh, the clip is about the um, smart city dashboard of Amsterdam. Rotterdam doesn't have one, so I came as close as I could. Thank you. 
So if you didn't know, this is the challenge. Yeah, so this kind of focus on, you know, it's not about gathering data, it's about using it efficiently. It's very much showing how the current efforts regarding understanding the urban environment and that very much um, accounts also for anything uh, related to the transition. And, you know, like even the sheer idea that you can uh, buy off your CO2 guilt. It's, um, it's, it's a rather technocratic dimension of the problems that we're dealing with. And this focus on constant quantification and the blind belief in numbers creates a sort of fake conviction about the neutrality of tech uh, and um, that um, together with science we are able to uh, make this fake sense of objectivism uh, that actually equals urban planning with problem solving. Uh, I think by now every city has a dashboard of sorts um, where um, this like focus on problem solving and efficiency uh, is, is something that really drives urban development and I think in that respect urban development, finance and tech have a sort of a romance uh, where um, they kind of constantly fit everything in various ratings and ra ranking and rankings um, uh, and, and through flexing this technological uh, arm they, uh, they try to respond or try to control an uncertainty and risk calculation becomes almost an obsessive practice uh, that, and that counts both for, uh, for financial institutions as it counts for governments and their uh, way to deal with, uh, with urban planning. And uh, this kind of optimization um, uh, controls not only what we, uh, what we do, but also the way in which we're supposed to see the world. It puts us in a constant need to measure and compare ourselves with others, but also to be efficient in about everything we do at all times. Um, and the, this worldview has claimed our lives, but also our imagination and the language which we uh, use, which in consequence makes it very hard to break out of. And um, I feel that to break out of it, uh, we need to counter it with different ways of looking and different ways of shaping the subjectivity, but like not in the individual subject, but more as a collective uh, uh, subjectivity that can also have a political dimension. And, you know, that is not to say that you cannot use data in urban planning in fruitful and productive um, ways, right? This, like, 3D GIS visualizations can be used to analyze many different things. And if you look at, um, uh, for instance, visualizing data in relationship to mobility and access to transit and uh, housing and uh, jobs, it can give you um, uh, um, an understanding of where efforts need to be placed in urban planning to uh, make the city more uh, justly um, uh, distributed, more the, the services of the city more accessible to its citizens. But I think what it often ends up um, being is, um, yeah, as the video showed, you know, looking at these key indicate, key performance indicators and searching for ways in which you can improve in these indicators. And if we look at Rotterdam, it's, it's a city that has a somewhat notorious history of utilizing data to improve what it frames as low livability. Um, to give you a little bit uh, more context about Rotterdam, I mean, you probably all know the 
part of Rotterdam that it has been uh, largely wiped out uh, um, from the surface of the earth during the war and that it's a port city with a very powerful uh, port. Um, in a way, somehow in the consciousness of the city, this idea has developed that there's no way of looking back. We always have to move forward. And this is the kind of narrative that is also very strongly, um, 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 how to say it, utilized by the marketing uh, machines of, of the city. It's um, very much a projection of the city uh, of the future that is constantly in becoming a better version of itself um, that to a large degree focuses also on the improvement of the self and uh, the notion of hard work. So the people of Rotterdam, they're capable of uh, making that change. They are hardworking. They're building the city of uh, tomorrow, but the city of tomorrow and like its better vision of itself is largely focused on the idea of economical growth and the accumulation of capital, which is probably closer to what the port cares about and not necessarily maybe what the inhabitants of Rotterdam always care about. And um, the truth is that probably the future of Rotterdam is way more bleak and way more complex than what the city is uh, presenting and that the climate crisis um, will play a significant role in how the city will develop and what impact will it have on its inhabitants, yet it's largely uh, absent in the discussion of its urban development. I mean, there is uh, the topic of the transition and climate adaptation, but it's not really a narrative that is addressed at the scale at which it needs to be addressed. And um, uh, to give you a little bit more uh, context about what else uh, is at play in Rotterdam, um, I want to give you an example of several policy um, um, uh, how to say it um, uh, several policies and, uh, and and ways in which they um, played out in the urban development of the city uh, so in 2003 uh, a forecast um, was presented that showed that by 2017, more than a half of Rotterdam's population would consist of non-Western immigrants. That scared a lot of politicians who then uh, warned that uh, crime and social problems would concentrate in neighborhoods where many unprivileged and, uh, uh, unprivileged, uh, and migrant population uh, lived. Um, so in a way to respond to that, um, uh, a law was constructed that was first implemented in Rotterdam and that's uh, where it takes its uh, nickname from, which is called uh, Rotterdam Law, but it's also known as the Special Measures for Metropolitan Problems uh, Act. Um, and that law uh, basically uh, disabled uh, a population that had low income and was, had migrant descent to settle in uh, specific neighborhoods of the city. But the problem was that uh, these neighborhoods in particular where the neighborhoods were available, uh, where cheap housing was available. So it, uh, what it effectively did is uh, it expelled these parts of population uh, from from the city. Uh, the scary part of it is that this process started in 2006 in Rotterdam. By now, uh, Rotterdam has withdrawn from some of the clauses um, of that law, but uh, several cities followed. So right now, it's a law that is in power in six different cities in the Netherlands. And despite the fact that research showed that the effectivity of it is close to nothing, 
And while indeed the population of these neighborhoods have changed, there is no way to prove that livability and safety have been affected in any way. And um, the, um, uh, even though it's uh, in place in many different cities, uh, Rotterdam still remains the, um, the, uh, the leader of, uh, of, um, of cities that implement that law. So 90% uh, of neighborhoods that use this law are in Rotterdam and most of them are in the south of Rotterdam. So the south of Rotterdam has been seen as a place so bad to live in that um, uh, on the national level, uh, a new uh, program has been started uh, that um, became a, a coalition of different partners, including the municipality of Rotterdam, the central government, the police, the public prosecutor's office, and housing corporations, healthcare institutions, educational institutions, and businesses to live up Rotterdam South from its low livability uh, index. Uh, that goal was supposed to be achieved by 2030, and the measure of it was that it had to reach standards comparable to the so-called um, G4 average, which is the average of the four bigger cities of the Netherlands, so Utrecht, The Hague, Amsterdam, and the rest of uh, Rotterdam. And that completely did not take into account that now uh, researchers looking at the effectivity of this plan realize that um, the population of Rotterdam South is not comparable with these other cities, so you will never be able to reach these standards if you formulate them uh, this way. And again, despite the fact that this program has been in place for 10 years and millions of euros have been invested, uh, one of its most visible effects are planned as well as realized demolitions, uh, sometimes of entire uh, sections of neighborhoods uh, resulting in population displacement. So this uh, map that you uh, see here are, um, is, um, it's a mapping done by a local news outlet that, uh, that put in picture all of the planned ongoing uh, demolitions and the planned uh, reconstruction. So this like, idea of urban renewal through demolition and building the new buildings for more affluent population is, um, um, let's say, seen as a way to sanitize the city and to um, increase its livability index. And one of the recent um, revelations uh, uh, published, um, I don't know, a month ago and to be presented, um, I think, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, um, is a uh, research uh, conducted by Lighthouse, also in collaboration with a few local uh, partners, um, where they discovered that the municipality of Rotterdam was using an algorithm uh, that was um, profiling uh, citizens um, who were receiving uh, welfare benefits uh, to schedule them for uh, checkups. Uh, whether they are not uh, using these benefits in a fraudulent uh, way. And um, I'm going to uh, quote uh, a part of the report uh, from Lighthouse. They say, Rotterdam's algorithm judges people on many characteristics they cannot control, such as gender and language skills. What might appear to a, uh, to a caseworker to be a vulnerability such as a person showing signs of, so, of low self-esteem is treated by the machine as grounds for suspicion where the caseworker enters a comment into the system. The data fed into the algorithm ranges from invasive, the length of somebody's last romantic relationship, and subjective, someone's ability to convince and influence others, to banal how many times someone has emailed the city, and seemingly irrelevant whether someone plays sports. Despite the scale of data used to calculate risk scores, 
experts say um, it performs little better than random selection. And based on this little better than random selection, more than a thousand people were interrogated and, uh, you know, often deprived of the right to, uh, to welfare benefits, or even if not, put through a terrible administrative procedure that is extremely uh, humiliating. So uh, what is also interesting that um, uh, here you see um, a, a kind of breakdown um, of the likelihood uh, for you to be uh, selected. So if you were in your 30s, you had children, uh, you lived with more than three people in a house, this could be your children, you were a uh, woman, uh, you had an addiction and you had uh, low um, uh, um, um, uh, language skills in Dutch, you were way uh, more likely to be uh, selected for, for such a checkup. And the fact that Rotterdam was chosen as the centerpiece of, uh, of this report uh, is not because it's doing something especially novel, it's because out of dozens of cities that Lighthouse researched, it was the only one willing to share the code behind its algorithm. And alongside this, it also handed over the list of variables that powered it, evaluations of the algorithm's performance and the handbook uh, used by its data scientists. Uh, so um, faced also with the prospect of potential court action under Europe's uh, equivalent to the um, uh, U.S. Sunshine Laws. It was also um, it also shared the machines, uh, the machine learning model capable of calculating scores uh, that um, uh, provided unprecedented access uh, to the researchers. Um, so I'm not going to get further into the details of it because I think it gives you already uh, a fair understanding of. Uh, what's at play and how data is used to um, construct a certain image of the city and to um, uh, yeah and to control its population in ways that are highly problematic. So if you think of whose imaginaries can shape the future of the city, I think it's quite clear that not everybody has. Um, the same right to, to think about a future at all. Um, and what the project um, that I'm working on at the New Institute is focusing on is how can we possibly challenge this Rotterdam's self-representation that is based on uh, profiling, uh, on uh, calculating different measures that focus on uh, the quality of the built environment, safety and social factors that are actually geared to show continuous improvement of the city, but improvement for whom you could ask, especially if uh, the port is excluded as a part of the city. So this is a screenshot of this uh, livability barometer, uh, which also um, defines uh, some of these uh, measures. And you see this really big gray gap right in the middle of the city. This is the uh, area at least partly managed by the port authority as the port is also moving out of the city, but still large chunks of it are port dependent and are providing a form of service uh, to the port. So if we're thinking about ecological measures and transition and we're not into taking into account the risks that the port is introducing and the influence that the that the uh, port is introducing to the city, you know, like we can talk about safety and uh, and uh, this, um, uh, the Dutch have the uh, way of uh, measuring or like 
referring to the um, undesired relationships as nuisance. Uh, so there's like all sorts of unwanted behaviors such as, uh, I don't know, like too much noise is accounted as such. You know, if you take port out of this equation, you know, what are we, what are we even talking about? And, and that's put into picture where Rotterdam has literally the lowest sustainability indicator in the entire country and is obviously also as Amsterdam and other cities um, uh, has a high, is, a, is a high environmental uh, risk um, area, um, but is also what I already mentioned before, a city with a highly diverse population where about 200 different uh, nationalities uh, live and where the Dutch actually are a numerical minority. So it's also, um, uh, it's, it's also a city of uh, uh, populist parties where uh, that struggles with a backlash against uh, migration and, and diversity uh, and which has been framed in, uh, uh, by some scholars uh, talking about uh, the notion of super diversity as the majority minority uh, uh, city. Um, so coming back to the, to the Atlas of Knowledge, um, which is our ambition, um, uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, find a way in which we could uh, design a transition to a more sustainable and inclusive city of which all inhabitants of Rotterdam could be a part of. Uh, and we feel that to do that, uh, other kinds of knowledges than the ones that can be represented through data need to be included. And that um, concerns minority, migrant, queer, female, uh, informal, embodied, and spectral um, knowledges. Um, uh, the question is, and it's an open question, uh, where can we find these knowledges? How can we recognize and value them? How we can make them visible? And how we can connect and confront them to the more formal knowledge, which is driving the transition of the city. So we're also not doing something that stands in complete separation of that, but that uh, allows to um, expand that image and make it uh, more complete. So yet again, to not try to see it as a single issue, but as a broadening of the spectrum. So the ambition of the Atlas is to redesign the available knowledge, organize it in a matter that allows to assess missing links, gaps, and lack of access. And it's supposed to function as a testing ground for the theoretical uh, framework. Uh, what we have been working with until now is um, this idea of majoritarian view and the minoritarian view, where the majoritarian view is, um, can be represented through information and data uh, where we already have access to available uh, networks. And this is mostly the information that is contributing to the current official self-representation of the city, such as uh, this um, uh, livability barometer that I already mentioned, or this um, uh, uh, website called uh, Neighborhood Profile, which is measuring these different uh, social uh, safety and uh, um, uh, um, what was, uh, sorry, I forgot what was the, uh, the third factor. Um, uh, the built environment, safety, and social factors. Um, that uh, is complemented by what we call the minoritarian view, uh, and where we're working on ways to collect, visualize, and, and broaden the spectrum of that knowledge. Uh, and what we find important is that uh, uh, the ones that are often uh, omitted, devalued, uh, or silenced, uh, should be uh, brought to the fore in one way or another. Um, but then the questions that we're facing 
based on which categories uh, can we do that and how can we avoid exploitation and mar further marginalization of um, those subjects. So while minor majoritarian knowledge can be represented and is often represented by quantitative data, what we see in result, this quantifiable data never really makes the case for minor Italian knowledge. And this is an example of one of these neighborhoods that have been demolished uh, last year in Rotterdam. So how can we start from the existing to create a form of, of counter power that would allow a broader spectrum of subjects to have an idea of what the future of the city uh, could be. And we know that Rotterdam has a vibrant scene of various citizen-led organizations, and actually plenty of them are concentrated in these so-called disadvantaged uh, neighborhoods. Um, but then again, um, this form of activity and knowledge in the city uh, asks for new forms of research and representation. And this is something that we're working through and have no complete answers to yet what, what they are. But uh, while working on that, I would like to show you a few examples where I think um, uh, other forms of mapping and atlases are um, using methods uh, that can be valuable also for, for us uh, to, to, uh, to work further with the subject. So um, the first example is um, the Atlas for the End of the World. It's, um, uh, it's a project that was conceived and uh, directed at the Chair of Urbanism uh, and Landscape Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, it's a series of maps that measures um, quantity of protected areas across the world's 36 biodiversity hotspots. Uh, and it compares them to United Nations 2020 targets, uh, as well as uh, identifies where future urban growth in these territories uh, is on a collision course with the endangered species. Um, it's fairly shocking to see that most of these urban areas don't have plans that account for biodiversity in any way. So in that sense, I think these maps are really a breakthrough that they are the first ones that visualize the risks of the projected uh, urban development and that actually make it actionable and debatable. Uh, which I think is a, is a very valuable uh, way of, uh, of looking at the um, uh, also highly uh, problematic aspect uh, of cartography, right? But I think that in this sense, it actually contributes uh, something uh, powerful to that um, uh, debate. Another one uh, is um, a subjective atlas, which is a series of workshops and publications and developed by subjective um, editions, what they actually did is to develop a methodology and this methodology they take to different cities uh, or different areas because they map cities as well as uh, uh, regions or like any kind of geographical um, area uh, where they um, uh, do basically field work with groups of students or participants. And um, uh, they also use this methodology to provide uh, a lens um, uh, that uh, tries to open up the question and, and uh, show different, uh, perspective, pr different perspectives present uh, in that area. And uh, also in a similar um, uh, way that we're trying to approach the subject, uh, it uh, also highlights the, um, the, the voices uh, that are often uh, quietened. Uh, I think this is a, a very um, uh, powerful way because it's, um, it also doesn't have a single representation, which on one hand can be very 
difficult to read, but on the other hand, it really shows that there's no one way to represent or see or understand a territory. And I think these kinds of, um, they really work with all sorts of media, uh, you know, from photography to these kinds of doodles and, and, and mappings. Uh, and I think also breaking away from that uh, strictly cartographic mapping has something powerful uh, to it and also do it, doing it in a way that is relevant for the community that, uh, that takes part in that mapping. Um, and um, the third one is um, uh, the work of monsoon assemblages. Uh, which, is, um, uh, which was a research uh, consortium uh, that mapped uh, or tried to f develop ways of understanding weather systems as world-making subjects and, um, and weather systems in relationship to, uh, to city-making and to uh, local cultural production. And um, this particular map shows uh, a South Asian um, a monsoon in 2016, uh, but also includes the instruments uh, that recorded the data from which the drawings were made. So, um, uh, and also which produces the kind of meteorological uh, um, knowledge. Um, so it includes uh, agrofloats, uh, data boys, uh, sensiometers, weather stations, uh, Doppler weather stations, and and observing uh, observing ships and satellites, uh, which shows uh, these meteorological drawings and maps, not as drawings of weather but as drawings of data. So also that blurring uh, between what is actually a weather system and how it's measured. So what. Uh, well, how is it represented? I think in that case um, has also a valuable characteristic because it allows to it allows certain transparency to show where the data is coming from and what is this image actually um, based on. So. Um, Right now, uh, together with a designer, Jos Grotens, we are exploring ways in which we could uh, find new forms of uh, representation that could become a gateway towards these imaginaries. We're um, encountering a lot of questions and, and struggles on that way. Uh, one of them is, yeah, how do you avoid translating uh, what we see in the city into data, and especially in the way that they have been working, which is often related to Excel sheets and visualizations on maps, you know, that how to break out of it, also in a design uh, process, um, has been a challenge, but also um, we're now exploring um, a way of map making that has been developed by Raoul Bunsholten. And uh, on one hand, I find this direction really inspiring because it also allows us to find different ways of note taking. On the other hand, I think the legibility of these systems is extremely limited. So if we want to uh, develop something that would be accessible and legible, we need to find different ways of, uh, of doing it. And um, um, the next steps uh, that um, uh, we're going to make, we're now in the process of uh, talking to partners, conducting interviews, and working through these uh, uh, different ways of asking questions, uh, testing out different forms of representation. Uh, but we also um, want to dive deeper into different ways of knowledge finding and what that, that means for representation. Um, uh, building relationship also as a way of um, protecting ownership and ensuring continuity because we know we cannot do this in, like we cannot do this on our own. We have to include the owners 
of this information the producers of knowledge and make sure that they can have a stake in this project but that they can also feel safe in it and that they can benefit from it in in return and um, yeah and, and working on developing a taxonomy that will allow to uh, understand the relationships between the different stories and, and knowledges that can be uh, represented in a in a visual way and the challenges with which I want to um, uh, end and um, hopefully we can maybe take it along in the Q&A are some of these questions that we also want to address in a series of uh, meetups um, and, uh, and research nights that we're, um, uh, that we're trying to define and plan right now um, are questions um, such as how to account for minoritarian knowledges and how to map what isn't uh, visible, um, uh, one that is really meaningful uh, uh, to me or that I'm really worried about that was also why I uh, asked it about the, um, uh, the capacity for betrayal, um, how to visualize and recognize them uh, without making them even more vulnerable than that they already are. And um, yeah, how can we uh, create something that could become a platform for collective debate about the future of the city that is not just a single vision uh, of, uh, of growth and capital accumulation? And um, yeah, how, how it can become something actionable? How can it become a tool uh, for, for futures or imaginaries? So, um, I know there's more questions than answers, but I hope that this gives us enough to discuss. And with this, I would like to thank you.